Open your Bibles to the book of Daniel. Last week as a congregation, we began a book study in Daniel. We got through the first chapter in the morning. We got to celebrate baptism in the evening. So we are up to chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2, beginning at verse 1, says, Now in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. Then the king gave the command to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. And the king said to them, I've had a dream, and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will give the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, My decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me and its interpretation, you shall be cut in pieces, and your houses shall be made an ash heap. However, if you tell the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts, rewards, and great honor. Therefore, tell me the dream and its interpretation. They answered again and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will give its interpretation. The king answered and said, I know for certain that you would gain time, because you see that my decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me, there is only one decree for you, for you have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the time is changed. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can give me its interpretation." The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There's not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. Therefore no king, lord, or ruler has ever asked such things of any magician, astrologer, or Chaldean. It is a difficult thing that the king requests, and there is no other who can tell it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. For this reason the king was angry and very furious and gave the command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree went out and they began killing the wise men and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. So let's pause and, and pray. Heavenly Father, you have taught that as we gather together in your presence, we are always to include the reading aloud of your word. And Lord, that's what we're doing out of Psalms and out of Daniel. Lord, we recognize this meets the scripture. This is your word. You have given it. You have breathed it. You have preserved it. You are here to speak it afresh by your Holy Spirit. What's on your heart, Lord? What are you saying to us in this chapter? We need some teaching. We need some revelation. We need some understanding. And Lord, once you grant that, we need some power to put into practice what you teach us. So our eyes are on you. You're the teacher, we're the students. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> As we get into uh, this particular chapter, we, we have something that is unique as far as uh, the way this book is written. You know, this book is written in Hebrew and in Aramaic. Uh, the, it starts off in Hebrew uh, in, in chapter 1, and it goes up through uh, Daniel 2.3 in Hebrew. Starting in Daniel 2.4 through Daniel 7.28, which is the end of the seventh chapter, all of this is in Aramaic. Now, Aramaic was uh, the language of the Chaldeans, the uh, Babylonians. It was their official language. Uh, it is going to, this language will spread. It will become a part of Jewish culture because of their time in captivity. Uh, the Persians will pick this up uh, as well. So Aramaic will be carried all the way down. You know, Jesus could speak uh, Aramaic. 
uh, Hebrews as official than, than Aramaic. So it's kind of, it's unique in that. Uh, most of the rest of the Old Testament is in Hebrew, the Old Hebrew. And of course, the New Testament is in Koine Greek. It's not the Greek we speak today, but it is the, uh, the Greek of ancient years. In other words, the language is settled. It doesn't change. And that's really important when it comes to the Word of God. Uh, because if you go back to the Hebrew, it's always going to be the Hebrew. You go back to the Greek, always going to be uh, the Greek. Living languages change and words change meanings. And that's why sometimes, you know, you, know, you try and read uh, Old English a couple hundred years ago. It doesn't sound like English today, does it? A lot of just even our English sometimes in the United States a hundred years ago doesn't sound like our English today. There are certain words that, that change because this is a, a living uh, language. And we love to adopt words, don't we? Just bring them in from other languages when we were celebrating a baptism last Sunday evening we uh, discovered that uh, baptize means to dip to immerse and it's still in the Greek form baptizo and a lot of times in English we just say well I like that we'll just say baptize we don't translate it we don't say to immerse or to dip we, we just adopt the word so for those who learn English as a second language, sometimes you get very frustrated because only 70% of the English language follows the rules we learned in school. So there's a lot of, of the, the English language that you have to get by context and it's a little tough, isn't it? If I say bat, Am I talking about a mammal that flies around? Am I talking about a piece of wood? Am I talking about a person who's standing at a plate who's going to swing? It's all bad, isn't it? Now, if you grow up with English, you just say, oh, that makes sense to me. But you know, I'm here to tell you that can be confusing. So God made sure that when it comes to the original autographs, uh, that, that Hebrew is going to remain the same and that Greek's going to remain the same. And that's why translations always go back uh, to the Hebrew and to the Greek. And that way we just don't have a paraphrase of a paraphrase of a paraphrase of a paraphrase. You know, we always go back uh, and that helps out because God's word is forever settled in heaven and it remains and we're teaching the old and the tried and the true we're not looking for some new secret meaning where we just want to know what's on God's heart well on God's heart today in this second chapter God wants us to know something about a king that he had set aside uh, this king's name is Nebuchadnezzar and he uh, he had been named he had been prophesied he had been uh, it had been proclaimed that he was going to be the fella who was going to uh, you know be in charge at this time and god can set aside anybody he wants to to be in charge that's god's business you know god is sovereign and god is holy and sometimes you and i agree with god's choices oh i think that was a pretty good guy that you set aside that was pretty good and sometimes it's like lord what are we supposed to learn because sometimes there are some real folks who are mean uh, and they are cruel and yet they have authority uh, sometimes not only over nations but over empires and and god can speak to them and god can uh, give revelation to them so this nebuchadnezzar uh worships false gods you know he is chaldean he's he's babylonian uh, and god the only god there is the god whom daniel served the god of abraham isaac and jacob the only god that there is uh, who created the heavens and the earth uh, spoke to him in a dream but he couldn't remember his dream he knew that it was important he knew that, that he needed to know what was going on and see he believed in his culture that his god spoke in dreams and visions and so they actually had people set aside to interpret they were part of the wise man's group and the wise men included those who were who were very wise as far as in mathematics and in the, their knowledge of the stars and uh, in astronomy uh, there were some who dabbled in the cult and that's how they uh, determined what was going on they, they just all kind of lumped together translated as magicians and astrologers and and uh, but these are the wise men uh, well there were some junior wise men at that time Daniel and his three friends they they were new in this particular group but they were gifted they were included in this particular group and that's why we're hearing about this 
So we are told that Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. They are God-given dreams, the only God that there is. And he could not remember, but he knew it was important. So he wanted to hear the dream, and he wanted to know what it meant. So he called those that had been set aside in his culture. So he called for the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, the Chaldeans. Uh, and so they came and they stood before the king. Verse 3 we read, The king said to them, I have had a dream and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. In other words, I know that it's important, but it's like I forgot. But I need you guys to tell me what the dream is and what it means. And they kept saying, well, you've got to tell us the dream. I mean, we have to have something to work with. He said, oh, no. I can't remember the details. But if you guys are as good as you're, you're supposed to be, then you tell me the dream and you tell me what it means. And they kept insisting that's not how it works. Nobody has ever required this of, of wise men. Nobody's ever made. You've got to at least give us the dream so we've got something that we can interpret. And the more they stalled, the madder he got. And so we have a portion of their conversation here. Uh, he gets to the point that he's so angry, he says, I don't even know why I need you guys. If you can't do something like this, I think it'd just be better if you were dead, that you weren't even here. We'll just, we'll just cut the budget. Uh, it says in verse 5, the king answered and said to the Chaldeans, my decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me and its interpretation, you shall be cut in pieces and your houses shall be made in ash heap. In other words, I'm going to destroy even the memory of you, even where you lived. Your neighborhood is going to be gone. However, if you tell the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from, from me gifts, rewards, and great honor. Therefore, tell me the dream and its interpretation. They answered again and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will give its interpretation. Now we discover that it is possible for those who worship worthless idols, those who worship worthless idols, the idols that cannot speak and cannot hear and they don't know anything, and it's all vanity when it comes to all false religion, that God can speak to their heart eternal truths. So here we have a king who worships worthless idols, Many of the gods, and there were many gods in, in Babylon at that time, there were several primary gods that were above others. And here God speaks to Nebuchadnezzar. His, his servants say, this is impossible what you have required. Verse 8, the king answered and said, I know for certain that you would gain time because you see that my decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me, there is only one decree for you. For you have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me until the time has changed. Therefore, tell me the dream and I shall know that you can give me its interpretation. Now, he understood human nature. He knew that they were stalling for time. The, more time. the more time they were stalling for, the madder he got. And you have to be careful because anger can get to a point that it leads to death. Anger can get to a point in the human heart that it leads to death. Anger can become hatred, can become wrath, can become murder. And we are told that it's at these very roots, you know, in the heart where these types of sins come from. And it's building up. You can see it right in front of us. It's, it's happening in the king's heart. And he has the authority. He can issue the orders. And these guys will really die. Verse 10, it says, The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There's not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. Therefore, no king, lord, or ruler has ever asked such things of any magician, astrologer, or Chaldean. In other words, no wise man has ever been required to do something like this. Now, first off, it's a false statement that no man can, can figure this thing out, that no man can receive what it is, because we're going to see that Daniel is going to receive from the Lord. Verse 11 says, it is a difficult thing. 
basically an impossible thing that the king requests. And there is no other who can tell it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. Do you understand that God does the difficult? God does the impossible. God does the miraculous. Jesus makes a way where there is no way. And this is one of those moments. The Lord is going to have to come through because the order is about to be given. And when the king gives the blanket order, even these new junior wise men, they're going to be included in the order. Their names are going to be on the list. When it's time to wrap up people for execution day they're going to come for Daniel and his friends and God wants us to know this bit of history verse 12 says for this reason the king was angry and very furious and gave the command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon uh oh Daniel's going to be included so the decree went out and they began killing the wise men and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Verse 14 now. Then, when, then with counsel and wisdom, Daniel answered Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree from the king so urgent? Then Arioch made the decision known to Daniel. So Daniel went in and asked the king to give him time that he might tell the king the interpretation. What are you going to lose, right? Aren't we commanded to ask in order to receive? What's the worst he can do is kill him. He's already been ordered dead anyway. So he asked permission to go in for a, a limited time. And it was granted. We keep going in verse 17. Daniel went to his house and made the decision known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions that they might seek mercies from the God of heaven concerning this secret, so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Now, Daniel goes to his fellow believers and basically says, here's what the problem is. We're going to have to go into prayer. And the goal is for God to tell us the dream that he gave to Nebuchadnezzar. And once he tells us the dream, then we also need to know the interpretation. Now, Daniel said that he was willing to go into prayer and he needed prayer support. He asked, he said, would you guys pray with me? Would you pray for me? Now, there are times you'll see Jesus using this model. Sometimes Jesus you know, is, is willing to be the one to lead in the prayer, to do what needs to, but he'll take some with him and he'd say, would you come with me? Would you pray for me? Do you remember even the night that he goes into the garden? And, and they're going to come in just a, a couple hours. They, they're going to come for him. And he takes his disciples with him. And he takes three disciples and he says, would you, would you pray, would you pray with me, for me? And he says, you guys pray here and I need to go over here. There's some things that I need to talk about, but I'm asking you to stay here as a group and that you pray for me, that you intercede. And every time he would come back and check on them, they had gone to sleep. They started off praying and they'd go to sleep. And then they'd start off praying and they'd go to sleep. And man, I wish we could point fingers at them, but we can't. You and I have done the same thing, haven't we? You know, we set ourselves in prayer and we're going to, yeah, we're going to pray for somebody. And next, boom, you know, we're just, we're out of it. God understands and he has to grow us up in this thing of prayer. Now, what's so wonderful about prayer is literally the, the end instant that we are born again in Jesus and our spirit comes alive now we can hear from the Lord it's not only God speaking every now and then to us but we we actually can hold conversations with the Lord do you understand that you are created in God's image 
God created you spirit, soul, and body. There, there's a seen you, there's a, there's a part of you that I can see, that's your body. And, but the real you lives inside. Your spirit and your soul lives inside of your body. The real you is referenced as your soul, your mind, your emotions, your personality, your will, the very distinct you. They're, they're, you're, you're very distinct. Even if you have a perfect twin in your body, the, the real you is different because you're made in God's image. The way you talk to people is through your body. Okay, as long as we've known people, the, the way we communicate with them is through their body. Uh, and so we see them, we can give them a hug and a handshake, we can, have, we can talk, we can chat, we can call them up. And that's why for us we're so sad when God calls people uh, to heaven, even though we love them so much, because you, know, you go to their body and you can't have a conversation anymore. They're not there. They just used that body while they were on the earth, and, and they're more alive than they've ever been. Well, the way you speak, your soul, the way you are, your mind, your emotions, your personality, your will, to other people is through your body. But the way you speak to God is through your spirit. But if your spirit is dead, how are you going to do that? That's the problem with being born human, isn't it? We are dead in our trespasses and sins. We must come alive. There's such a thing as to be born physically. There's such a thing as to be born again, to be born spiritually. And when you're saved, when you repent of your sins and you cry out to Jesus for mercy, have mercy upon me, forgive me, come into my life. When Jesus does that, he moves in by his Holy Spirit and your spirit comes alive. That's how you talk to God, the way your soul, your mind, your emotions, your personality, your will, the way you talk to God is through your spirit. You see, you talk to people through your body, but you talk to God through your spirit. But if your spirit's dead, you can't have a conversation. But the instant that you are, all of a sudden you can. The life's new. Now, we were taught about prayer. Uh, if you grew up in a Christian family, you were taught about prayer. Uh, and you were taught about who to address that to. And so we, we learned how to do that. I, all my life, I can remember praying. I was taught how to, to pray when I go to sleep. I was taught how to pray over the food. I was taught how to, you know, pray over certain things. But uh, all that, boy, just comes alive when you're born again. For me, I happen to be 12 when I saved. Sometimes folks are in their teenage years, sometimes young adults. Sometimes I've known folks in their 80s come to Christ. But there is a change. And uh, we start off very basic in this prayer life, and we just grow. There's no end to it. Do you understand that prayer can do anything that God can do? <laughs> Holy Spirit-inspired prayer can do anything that God can do. Holy Spirit-inspired prayer can do anything that God can do. And so we're talking about serious praying here. Now, certainly all the wise men prayed, but almost all the rest of those guys prayed to, uh, to uh, false gods. Uh, they, they prayed to gods. You know, they can't see anything. They can't hear anything. They can't talk. They're idols. You know, it's just vanity. So you just have a lot of tradition. You make up all sorts of stuff. But it's very different when you're born again and you can talk to the only God there is. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the creator of the entire universe. And we, we come into his presence through what Jesus did on the cross. And you'll hear that a lot in our prayers. We'll say, Lord, we come before you in the name of Jesus. Our Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, here we are. In other words, the way that Jesus opened, that's the way that we come. And, and prayer is not just a lecture. We don't lecture God, and he doesn't lecture us. It is a conversation. Uh, we get to share our heart. God shares his heart, and you can really grow in prayer. Well, Daniel and his friends were, were already pretty dynamic in prayer at this point. They are still very young men. Remember, they are teenagers uh, when they are taken. And so they're in late teens, early 20s, probably about at this particular time. And they, they understand this concept of prayer. And there's a certain things you can pray for and you get right away. Some things you have to really set aside some time. And you have to really concentrate. And you have to get rid of all those other voices that are out there. And all the other distractions that are out there. And sometimes you even have to get rid of the distraction of your body. Sometimes you'll skip meals. You'll fast. You know, because you just have to hear from the Lord. You have got to hear from God. I mean, this is serious praying. That's where they were at. They were at that level of prayer. Because if you don't get an answer, you're dead. If you don't get an answer, you make your will because tomorrow we're coming from you. This is serious praying. This is not light praying. This is serious praying. There have been times you've probably been at that point. Lord, if you don't come through, 
uh, it's, it's finished. It's over with. My life is ruined. It could be a health concern. It could be a financial concern. It could be a personal relation concern. But you have probably at some point, you've been to that point that you just have to hear from God. You cannot ignore it. You have to put everything else on the shelf. Everything else has to go. And it's just you and Jesus. And you can't stop until you get an answer. And this is one of those times. And this is part of And God, nothing's too hard for the Lord. So you have Daniel knowing because he's been gifted in dreams and visions before. And God has given him interpretation. So here's what's a little different. He's got, he's got to give him the dream. And then he's got to give him the interpretation. So he's asking for prayer support. It is right to ask for prayer support. Now, just make it support. Don't dump what you should be praying about on somebody else. In other words, it's right to provide prayer support. But don't say, when you should be praying about that too, you're going to count, well, those guys pray a lot, so I'm going to let them hope they're praying for me. Do you understand? You, you Don't stop praying just because you ask somebody to stand with you in prayer. Don't dump your responsibilities in prayer on somebody else, but it is certainly right to say, I need prayer support. Here's what I'm up against. This is what I'm praying about. Would you stand with me? Would you support me in this thing? And it is right to do that. And you get good results. It says that they might seek the mercies from God of heaven concerning this secret so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Verse 19. We're in Daniel 2.19. Then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. So Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Now you have dreams and you have visions. If you're asleep, it's a dream. If you're awake, it's a vision. And that's about the only difference in Scripture. So he was awake at night. It was a night vision. You could have a day vision. It's during the day. It's bright and you have a vision. He was awake at night and he got a vision. Okay, that's the only difference. God can speak in visions. He can speak in, in dreams. And that's what, so God answered. And he said, what is it? What is it? What is it? What is it? Well, here's what he did first. There were several things he did before we get to find out what the dream is. So the first thing Daniel does, so Daniel blessed the God of heaven. In other words, the creator of all, the creator of the entire universe. He blessed them. Thank you, Jesus, for coming through. You did it again. Hallelujah. Oh, God. You know, every time you think we would remember that God came through the last time, but we really get nervous and down and we struggle, don't we? And then we're so excited all over again when he comes through again. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'm just whew, glad you're still there. So Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, and God was so pleased with this blessing that he recorded it. And it's right for us to bless God in this same manner. He said, blessed be the name of God forever and ever. In other words, God lasts forever. God is eternal. That's the God he's speaking to. Not man-made and not false, not counterfeit, the only true God there is who is eternal God. Then he says, for wisdom and might are his. In other words, nothing is too tough for God. Nothing is too tough for God. Wisdom, might are his. He changes the times and the seasons. He is all powerful. He removes kings and raises up kings. God is active in the lives of mankind. God is behind history. Do you see that? No nation can rise. No nation can fall. There can't be a change in kings unless God is behind that process. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. God is all-knowing. There is no question that's too tough for him. He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness and light dwells with him. You know, that which is referred to as a secret or a mystery in Scripture is something that man cannot know until God reveals it. It's not that it cannot be known. It requires God to give the revelation. And God likes to reveal that kind of stuff. You know, you, you'll never figure it out on your own. God has to be merciful and he has to give revelation. Do you understand that what you and I know about God is by revelation? You and I aren't smart enough to figure God out. 
If we broke ourselves into four different committees of the groups that are here and we spend a month trying to figure out God and we all come back and, and come up with stuff, man, we're going to have four different gods, aren't we? I mean, we just, we're not smart enough to figure out God. What you and I know about God is by revelation. God comes to us and he says, I am God. Here, this is the way I am. This is what I have done. These are my character traits. This is what I'm going to do. There's just certain things that God has handpicked. And so we want to know what God has revealed. What God has not revealed is none of our business. But I promise you, there is a lifetime of good living in Jesus in the revelation that is given in the scriptures. That it's amazing what God shares about himself, about the way he does things, what he has done, what he's going to do. And a lot of it is wrapped up in this particular dream, this vision that is given unto uh, Nebuchadnezzar. So verse 23, we continue on after he blesses God and he declares who he is. He pauses to say, verse 23, I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and might and have now made known to me what we ask of you. For you have made known to us the king's demand. He, before he tells anybody else, he goes into this time of worship. Now he came into God's presence and he came asking in order to receive. We are commanded to do that. If you want to know, then you set aside everything else and you come into God's presence and you ask in order to receive. That's a biblical concept. When God gives revelation, it is right to worship the Lord to hallow his name, to praise him. That is right. There's a biblical concept there that we still put into practice today. So after whatever time it took, and he only had that night, so I can't tell you, well, it was 15 minutes, it was three hours, it was, eight, I don't know. But they, they had it done at night, didn't they? The guy they heard from God. And God records what, how he said thank you. How he, he blessed the Lord. He hallowed God's name. And then he says thank you. I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and might. And have now made known to me what we ask of you. For you have made known to us the king's command. He says, you be, here, here you've got four guys. I know that Daniel is taking the lead. And Daniel's the one who's going to receive. But he's got three others who are standing. They're, they're praying. You know, they, they haven't received some of these giftings for dreams and visions, but they, they know that Daniel has. And I mean, they're standing in the gap. They're praying for him. They're, they're praying over him. They're, they're, they're doing everything they know to do to be a blessing in the spiritual realm at this time. Verse 24 says this, Therefore Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus to him, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Take me before the king, and I will tell the king the interpretation. Then Arioch quickly brought Daniel before the king and said thus to him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah who will make known to the king the interpretation. The king answered, answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head upon your bed were these. So he takes a moment to boast in the Lord. He takes a moment to give God credit. I'm not smart enough to figure this out. You know, four of us could get together. and We're not smart enough to get it done. But God told us. God has revealed this secret. And here is what you saw. And then here is what it means. As for you, O king... 
Thoughts came to your mind while on your bed about what would come to pass after this. And he who reveals secrets has made known to you what will be. But as for me, this secret has not been revealed to me because I have more wisdom than anyone living. But for our sakes who make known the interpretation to the king and that you may know the thoughts of your heart. He says, God has granted your request to know the dream and to know what it means. Okay, so there is, he understands, uh, the King Nebuchadnezzar is going to owe a debt to God, the God of Daniel. Because God doesn't share these things just for trivia's sake. There is a response that is required. Uh, there is something that God desires. There should be a change that takes place in response to revelation from God. And here's what he says in verse 31. You, O king, were watching, and behold a great image. This great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. And then it was, that's it, that's it, that's it. Yeah, that's it. That, yep, that's what I saw. And then he gives the interpretation. And we're going to have to get to the interpretation at the next teaching because it's pretty extensive. But remember, he says, God is showing you what will happen in the latter times. In other words, from the time of Nebuchadnezzar until the time that Jesus comes back, that's what this, this vision is all about. If you've uh, known Jesus for a while and you've read through the scriptures and you get to the prophetic parts, you'll discover that this vision is real key. Because remember, uh, scripture interprets scripture and the Holy Spirit will never contradict the Holy Spirit. So everything has to fit very smoothly together on various prophecies. If they're given to Zechariah, if they're given to Isaiah, if they're given to Daniel, if they're given to John the Apostle, they've all got to fit together. They don't compete with each other they all have to fit together and this is a real key part because he's going to see the empires of men starting with Babylon and then ending with an empire of man that will be present when Christ comes and that stone that, that comes uh, is is a picture of Jesus I'll tell you and you notice there is a destruction of all that of men which has come in the time before the time of the Gentiles literally ground to power are blown away but then there is a kingdom of God that is established on this earth and that stone grows to a great mountain and it fills the whole earth if you ever study prophecy if you ever get into that I know there's great debate and people love to argue and there's really no need if you stay in the word there's no need to argue if you just stay in the word but always go to the good guys winning do you understand, even at the beginning, as we have these prophecies, it all goes to Christ's kingdom, the return of Christ, Jesus coming, ruling and reigning on this earth, and then as establishing a new heaven and a new earth. Always go to the end. Don't st stop with Babylonians or Medes and Persians or the Greeks or the Romans or, uh, you know, a ten nation confederacy that comes out of the old Roman Empire that's ruled by a false Christ. Don't stop there. Go all the way to Jesus. Do you understand that Jesus wants you to know he wins? The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. You and I, you need to know which side you're on. You need to know where we're at. And man, we're getting close. That's all I can tell you. We are not to set dates and we are not to put times on there. But wow, are we getting close. 
because we're, we're boy the vast majority of this vision we'll discover as we go through it tonight has been fulfilled and there's just a little bit that we're waiting for here toward the end this toes thing and then this coming of the Lord and you don't have to figure all of it out at one time because you're going to keep reading scripture because then there's going to be some other prophecies and then of course the book of Revelation just ties it all together and God expects you to have already had all of this in your heart before you get to the book of Revelation. A lot of folks love to, let's study the Revelation. Okay. But you understand that nearly every other book in Scripture is mentioned in Revelation. You've got to go back an awful lot. It's like a, you know, third grader saying, we'd like to study calculus. Well, that's fine. You know, so you make sure they've got their addition and they've got their subtraction and they're learning how to do their multiplication. No, 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 I want calculus. I understand. Now you're going to have to learn division. No, 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 you don't understand. No, I, now we were doing fractions. See, you, you need to build to that. You don't go right from addition, subtraction into calculus. And there's folks, they just want to hop into Revelation and don't help. They haven't read any other scripture. And then they come up with these interpretations. Okay, so God expects you to have read the rest of scripture before you get to Revelation because it ties it all up and it all fits. You know, don't try and do this thing backwards. Let's just do it just the way God does it. You all have been very patient. One thing we discover here is that God is all-knowing. God is all-powerful. God is active in what we call history. God is behind history. Nations cannot rise or fall without God being active in that process. God knows. Now when you begin to fret and you begin to worry, and there's a lot of worry people have about the future, you're going to have to go with your strengths. What do you know? What do you know for sure? The one thing I know for sure about next week is that Jesus is already there. The one thing that I know for sure about next year, Jesus is already there. The one thing I know for sure 10 years down the road is that Jesus is already there. The one thing I know about 100, 200 years from now, Jesus is already there. The one thing I know about eternity is that Jesus is already there. Stick with the one who is eternal, holy God who cannot be defeated. Do not fret over the interpretations of men or the guessing of men. Fulfill the call on your life in this generation, and let's get closer to the end here. God has chosen we live at this time. He could have chosen that we live back with the Medes and the Persians or the Greeks or the Romans and all, but he's chosen that we live at this time. So let's live as the victorious church in this time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your encouragement. We thank you for your vision. We thank you for your hope. And Lord, you are the one who wins and you have everything under control. Lord, we're in the midst of a great struggle and without you, we would quit. Without you, we would run and hide. But in Christ, we can do all things. You are our hope of glory. Lord, we thank you that you have everything under control. You are holy God. We need you. We need your peace. We need clear uh, direction, Lord. And we ask you for it. It's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.